Mother Nature spoke and the city of Rancho Palos Verdes listened. The annual Well of the Day celebration was canceled on March the 1st due to heavy rains. The good news is the event is rescheduled for Saturday, April the 5th at the Palos Verdes Interpretive Center. Liz Brown Swanson joins us with more on Well of the Day. <laughs> Hi, Maria. Yes, this is the first time in the city's history that Whale of a Day had to be rescheduled. The good news is it's moving forward, like you said, on April 5th, Saturday. And joining me now with the city's Rec and Parks Department is Mona Dill. She is the Whale of a Day coordinator. It's so great to talk with you. Very exciting that Whale of a Day was able to be rescheduled to April 5th. You're ready for it. You bet we are, Liz. Bring it on. <laughs> well, tell us what's on board for this year's Whale of a Day. I think most of the public is going to find that things haven't changed one bit. We have every single one of our organizations, which is over 22, with the exception of one that can't join us for this whale of a day. All of our entertainment is going to be the same, so we're anticipating just another great whale of a day. Whale of a Day is a celebration of the migration of the whales. Talk a little bit about that, how it all got started, and why we do this year after year. Well, of course... PVIC is one of the most premier whale watching centers that we have on our California coast. So that's reason to celebrate just by itself. So we really are celebrating the, you know, the migration of the whales starting up in Alaska and the Chukchi Seas all the way down to the San Ignacio Lagoons down in Cabo San Lucas. So it really is something to celebrate. And these whales really cooperate every whale of a day. There's definitely the bell is ringing and those whales do come by. That is absolutely <laughs> correct. For the most part, they're going to be heading north at this point in time, but they're still going to be out there. And of course, when Will of a Day comes, you co-sponsor it with the group Los Serenos to Point Vicente. They are the docent group that's here volunteering daily to help run the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. Talk about their role and the fact that you co-host with this group. Well, Los Serenos is whale of a day. Really, it's all about them and on the countless volunteers and the countless hours that they put in. So we, the city just provides the support and the location, and really, they do all the hard work. So kudos to them. They're an awesome group. There's really something here for the whole family. Absolutely. And we have lots of entertainment, too. We have our Dance for Oceans Dancing Trash Zombies again. We've got our cloggers back. We've got uh, PV strings with our little violinists and their little whale tail hats, which is kind of fun. We also have a, a great surf band music called the guitars which has been very popular the last few years so everybody's back it should be a hoot one other thing new opportunity for when people come here is there's a surprise out in the back patio the palace Verdes peninsula rotary club has made a donation talk about um, the new addition to this year's whale of a day this is such exciting uh, addition that we have coming. We have a fixed set of binoculars, so you'll be able to go out on the back patio and for free and look around and you'll be able to see much further than you could with a naked eye or even with our borrowed binoculars. So that's gonna be great. Of course, a great tip for those coming to Whale of a Day, when you're on that back patio, you'll see a lot of members from the American Cetacean Society. Society. They're the census takers here, counting the whales. Yeah, the American Cetacean Society, boy, what a dedicated group. They're here bright and early, and they're here till the sun goes down. So they're here counting away. So this is our third best year in 30 years now. So that's really exciting. Anything important that you want to add to let people know other than to come on down, especially about how they get down here? That's correct. So parking is very limited here at the Interpretive Center. So we're going to have a free shuttle up from uh, Rancho Palos Verde City Hall, and it'll be coming by about every 10 minutes. So that's how people will arrive here, 10 to 4. We hope everybody can join us. Well, we know it's going to be a great time. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you, great. Mona Dill. Thanks for all you do for the city. Really important community event, one of, the, one of my favorite events for everyone to enjoy. Again, the 30th annual Whale of a Day will be held right here at PVIC from 10 to 4, and we want to see you there. And check out the website, whaleofaday.com. Back to you, Maria. Again, the Well of a Day event will take place on Saturday, April the 5th, so mark your calendars and we hope to see you out there. RPV leaders and residents recently received a report card grading the city's infrastructure. The report was released at an infrastructure management workshop. Mayor Jerry Dehovic talks with Liz Brown Swanson about the findings. <laughs> At the infrastructure workshop, it was, it was basically broken down into three areas. We had an, an infrastructure report card, which was step one, uh, and section one of the presentation. Uh, next, which was basically phase two, which is the uh, infrastructure management plan, the IMP, as it's affectionately called. The third part was potential financing. And, and this meeting was designed to be very, very broad in nature. Um, I think I had heard uh, there was a bit of discontent and, and some thought it was going to be much more explicit in nature. Um, but this was step one and I think it served its purpose. 
Um, really what this was to bring forward, again, the report card is on a very macro level, um, you know, 50,000 foot, where are we based on the opinions of experts in this area, uh, using various guidelines for, uh, for lack of a better term, grading or, or rating of our infrastructure. And there were eight categories there, you know, buildings, parks, trails, sewers, drains, and uh, I don't have all the right. all the explicit categories in front of me, but it was eight categories. But for example, in the report card, A for trails, D for buildings, but what does all that really mean and how do you get the report card? That's a whole other story. Sure. Well, no, that, that is the report card. And again, it was designed to be a very macro level, and it's subjective because we, we hired a consultant to come in and do this. The work papers uh, I'm, were to be, his work papers were to be posted on the website because there really was very little supportive documentation at the meeting. And I think that might have frustrated some people, but it was right. voluminous and it's going to be posted on the website. Um, but, but really more so, you got to take it to the next step. The actual infrastructure management plan is where a lot of that detail is coming. Um, this, the, the first part, the report card, subjective, somebody's opinion based on their expertise and, and guidance from various uh, rating agencies and what have you. But really the infrastructure management plan uh, which is very cutting edge and, and cities of our size normally don't have something like that is my understanding and I haven't seen it but that gets into the, the detail and the minutiae. It talks about um, you know where are we with a particular category let's call it storm drains and, and what information it, it, it brings all that information together in one central place and talks about uh, where we are what needs to be done uh, how does this interplay with other things that may need to be done in conjunction with the building replacement or what have you and how are you going to finance it? So that the plan puts that all together in one global macro place so, so we as a city and, and as a council can make intelligent decisions with respect mm -hmm. to infrastructure. The infrastructure report card and management plan will continue to be discussed at upcoming meetings. For more information, you can go to the city's website at palosverdes.com slash rpv. Well, it's that time of year when the City of RPV and EDCO are sponsoring a free paper shredding event on Saturday, April the 26th from 9 a.m. to noon. The event takes place at the RPV City Hall parking lot where residents can safely dispose of personal documents which are shredded by a certified shredder company on site. E-waste will also be collected and free mulch will be available to residents while supplies last. John Clayton has more. I've got all this stuff here that I've got to tear that up and what I've got so much stuff here I've got to get rid of it. Oh, Lauren, Lauren, you can help me. What am I going to do with all this? Stop it, uh, John. We have a shredding event coming up. You can get these all these your private documents to a shredding event. Oh my goodness, I don't need to do all I can what, what exactly is the shredding event and when is it? Um, if you have any private documents, bank statements, tax returns, mortgage payments, uh, insurance documents, those are uh, sensitive information with your social security or date of birth or anything that you think is private and confidential, you can take it uh, to a shredding event. So it will be shredded uh, in front of you on site and all your material will be left uh, confidential. The first thing that occurs to me is you say a shredding event it's probably my British sense of humor, but a shredding <laughs> event, that's, is, that's a big thing, right? Well, yes, we get about four to 500 cars coming to this event. And wow. um, they, it's very popular, and uh, they look forward to, 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 for the city to have it. You know, you mentioned Social Security documents, or you said something about bank statements. That's a very private thing. I mean, am I going to be quite safe in shredding those? Can I be sure that they will be shredded? Yes, we have certified shredding trucks on site that will shred all your documents right there. You can watch it happen. Nothing will be left unshredded. And this is all completely free? This is free. It's offered to RPV residents. So you oh, have yeah. to uh, bring uh, some kind of proof of ID, um, driver's license, utility bill, and it's uh, offered by the city and ETCO. Tell us one more time the weekend and the month and the day and the time. Sure. It's on a Saturday, April 26th. It's from 9 a.m. to noon. And it's going to be at the City Hall in the parking lot. 
and um, there are going to be um, special traffic plans. So I want to make sure everybody, you know, drives very carefully and uh, is patient and uh, one car at a time will be serviced from. Uh, they will also collect all your unwanted electronics like computers and your um, um, and then they will offer and TVs. And also they will offer free mulch to the gardening enthusiasts. But the mulch is a, a self-serve, self-haul service. When you say free, there's no coffee and cakes. Um, no, unless you want to bring it for me because I'll be working the event. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Lauren Ramazani. Thank you, John. Okay. I'll see you at the shredding event. And when we come back, it's a very special Valentine's event that lasts all year long. And are there dinosaurs in Rancho Palos Verdes? We're going to tell you when we come back. Hi, I'm Deputy Chris Knox. I'm here to remind you of the importance of sharing the road. If you are driving, watch out for motorcycles. They can be hard to see. When you ride a motorcycle, always make sure to wear full reinforced safety gear, including a jacket, long jeans, boots, gloves, and a DOT approved helmet. There are four components to a DOT compliant motorcycle helmet. A DOT sticker, a metal D-ring clasp, an inch of padding, and a manufacturer's label. If you need more information regarding motorcycle safety gear, make sure to check out your local motorcycle dealer or the Motorcycle Safety Foundation. When we follow these rules, we can all share the roads safely. This message is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. An extremely rare prehistoric whale skull was discovered right here on the peninsula at Chadwick School. A 7th grade science teacher came across the fossil and it was then authenticated by the Los Angeles Natural History Museum. John Clayton brings us more. I never thought we'd have to go back 12 million years to find an interesting story. Come with me and I'll show you why this is a really unique feature. We're talking with Martin Beihauer, the gentleman who uh, discovered this. How exactly did you discover it? Well, we have these really cool fossils that we walk by every day uh, here on campus and as a Past. We meaning you and all these students. All the students and all, and all the faculty. Uh, some walk by and don't notice it, others have been noticing them and I've been wondering about them for a long time. And the whole thing, the, the thing that scientists do is they look at things and they wonder. And my curiosity got the best of me because I knew these were whale fossils but I wanted to know a little bit more about them and uh, particularly this one that we discovered that's really special. I had no idea what I was looking at. Tell us exactly where you're from and what you're here for. I'm from the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and I'm here to pick up this sperm whale skull that was found here on Chadwick School. When you first got the message about this, I mean, what were your first thoughts? Well, I got the message to come up here and identify some fossils. And I thought, okay, you know, there's fossils up here, so I can go do that. That's what I do. It's really fun. I love it. So I came up here and looked at some vertebrae and some ribs of some various whales. And then Martin showed me this skull. I took one look at it and said, that's a very important skull. It needs to come to the museum. That takes a lot of intelligence and sort of perception to realize that. Well, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I've seen a lot of bones, I've seen a lot of skulls, and what we're trained to do is look at a rock and kind of identify what's showing and try and figure out what it is just by what's showing on the outside of the rock. Well, it's, uh, it's rare that a K-12 through school gets to actually add to the body of knowledge that's uh, in the scientific community, so we're thrilled with this opportunity that's actually been sitting here under, right <laughs> under our eyes for many, many years. This certainly gives uh, Chadwick a huge amount of, uh, I don't know, notoriety, publicity. I mean, it's an incredible find. Well, it is, and I guess it, for our students, it, it opens their eyes to the fact that there are things all around them that, that maybe they should be taking note of, and there's so many wonderful scientific questions to be asking about everything that's uh, around us in Los Angeles. Okay, 12 million years, and this is the end of the line. Now it is off to the Natural History Museum. What a wonderful ending for a fabulous whale found in a rock at Shadwick School right here on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. 
Mark your calendars. The 11th annual Los Angeles Harbor International Film Festival kicks off Thursday, March the 27th. The weekend film festival takes place at the historic Warner Grand Theater in San Pedro. Liz Brown Swanson joins us now with the details. <music> Hi, Maria. I'm at Ports of Call in San Pedro, and we're about to meet with the organizers of the 11th annual LA Harbor International Film Festival that takes place the last weekend of March at the historic Warner Grand Theater. We are excited. We have our 11th year coming up. We've had a glorious decade. This year is another wonderful array of programs, starting with Read the Book, See the Movie, White Fang. Well, every year is interesting and great because you have a variety from everything from documentary films like the films that I produce to great old classic films that are really meant to be seen on the big screen and you never get a chance to. And now with her festival, you can. So it's, it's really, it's neat. I'm very excited that the Los Angeles Harbor Film International Film Festival has selected White Fang to be the film this year for read the book, see the movie. There's about a thousand students that are going to be reading the book and then seeing White Fang. We filmed White Fang up in Alaska at the very place that Jack London wrote it. The biggest challenge was shooting with wolves at 40 degrees below zero at night. What are some of the other movies you've been involved with? Well, I directed The Blue Lagoon and Grease and uh, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid and Big Top Pee Wee. But I think White Fang is one of my favorites. We have our Holly Nostalgia tribute. And that's Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Hence the image behind me, the cinematic baseball bridge, which is an homage to that movie about a 1910 baseball team that Esther Williams inherits and becomes the manager of, with Gene Kelly and uh, Frank Sinatra dancing through the, the baseball game. Friday night opening is something we're also really delighted to participate in. It's called the Big Read LA, which is like one city, one book. This year it's Jumpa Lahiri's book called The Namesake, and she's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And the movie is directed by Mira Nair, who a lot of people remember from Monsoon Wedding. And it's going to be very colorful, very interesting. It's a story of a, an Eastern Indian immigrant family. And we culminate our program with Doc Sunday, our big tradition. And we have the new Filmmakers LA video project for the second year in a row, which are 19 short films, five minutes or less all about LA. So I produce documentary films. I've made a couple films that are uh, of our area here, including Port Town, which is playing again this year. When I made Port Town, uh, gosh, it's been eight years um, ago, we, we premiered it at the, at the festival. And it, Stephanie asked me if I'd like to show it again because of all the different things that are now going on on the waterfront. So we thought it'd be a great year to show it again. How do filmmakers, if they want to submit to you, I mean, how do, how do you pick? Go to the website and find the contacts to Stephanie Martisich. We like people, though, we tell them it must correspond to our mission, which is to embrace all the harbor is about, to create a cinematic bridge between the people of the region and the people of the world. There's a red carpet night? Yes, the red carpet evening. It's an homage to the Dodgers. We're expecting Maury Wells on our, our red carpet, maybe Tommy Lasorda. That's why we have so much Dodger blue in our festival poster and the t-shirt I'm wearing. I just want you all to come out and enjoy the movies. And there's great popcorn at the Warner Grand Theater, March 27th through 30th. And no doubt the 11th annual LA Harbor International Film Festival will provide lots of entertainment for all. And you can log on to the website at laharborfilmfest.com. Back to you, Maria. The Norse Theatre held its annual Valentine's Ball fundraising event at the Terranea Resort. This year, the theme was the music of the night that brought out a very special guest to the hill. Rocco Fonzarelli catches up with the honoree at the event. Oh, thanks, Maria. Hey, we're here at Terranea Resort at the Valentine Ball. We're doing a fundraiser for the Norse Theatre. Come on, let's go check it out. Now, you are being honored tonight. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel? It's a great honor. Uh, they have so many candidates that they could have picked, but they picked me. <laughs> I have no idea why, but they did. Maybe it's because I've run the uh, 
Valentine Ball four different times. And, uh, you know, I've always been a big fan and supporter of the Valentine Ball. And so I'm always there uh, bringing stuff, uh, invaluable stuff for the um, for the auctions. All right. Now, is there anything on the table that you see that you're going to bid on? Is there, what, what, What's out there for you? Well, if I can get around, if I finish with my interview on time before they close it, the Chanel bag and the Judith Lieber bag, probably I'd like to go and see if I can get it for my children. All right. Yes. The reason I'm here tonight is to support the Norris Theater. They've been on the hill for decades and we're here at Terranea. Terranea has been a terrific supporter of the Norse over the years. They are, uh, they, they are helping support us tonight with this huge gala. There's, I think, almost 350 people in the room right now. And, uh, and so I'm here uh, with my wife, Susie, tonight uh, doing the same thing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a living legend. Gail the Bennett. <laughs> phantom himself. <laughs> How are you tonight? I'm great, man. Thanks for having us. Thank that, you. Thank that you. was amazing, both of you. Oh, thank you. So let me ask you this: um, When you play the Norse Theater, what's mm. it like? What is it like to play the Norse? Well, Theater? Well, first of all, it's just one of the most little jewel box intimate spaces. So yeah. when you're on stage playing there, it feels like the audience is just like you're in someone's living room almost. It's, it's so intimate, and you feel so close to the audience, and I, I hope they feel close to the performers, because it feels just like we're all in the same room together. It's really wonderful. Wonderful. Gail, what, what's been your favorite show so far? Favorite show at the Norris, clearly, was White Christmas for me. Uh, it was just such a delightful experience. To, I, I'm obsessed with Christmas and the holidays, and to share that spirit with the, the theater goers, and to celebrate it with music and dance, and God, that choreography in that show was so good, and the actors were so wonderful, and there was, who doesn't like the story of White Christmas? I mean, um, so it's been such a delight to be able to do it two years in a row. At wow, the nice, very nice. And, um, you know, everything that they do is very special because it is so intimate, and that is, and it's special because it's in a location that without the Norris, we, you wouldn't have live theater. Yeah. So, I love it. Um, let me ask you this, where's your date? I don't have one. Oh, well, I'll, t I, yeah, yeah, I'll take over then. I'll see you later, okay. <laughs> And when we come back, there are some exciting classes going on right here on the grounds of City Hall. And what does it take to impress one of the toughest coaches on the Hill? We're going to tell you that and more when we come back. What if a disaster strikes without warning? What if life as you know it has completely turned on its head? What if everything familiar becomes anything but? Before a disaster turns your family's world upside down, it's up to you to be ready. Get a kit. Make a plan. Be informed today. Learn how at ready.gov. It's time for sports. Now, wrestling takes dedication and discipline to be the very best. Everything from getting enough sleep to a regimented diet is essential. At Peninsula High, wrestling coach Mike Liebig introduces us to one of his very best who does whatever it takes and then more. Time to catch up with Cameron Williams. And you can see more of my interview with Cameron Williams on an upcoming episode of Playing the Field. And if you're looking to broaden your horizons in computer learning, look no further than PVNet, which is located right here on the grounds of City Hall. PVNet is a nonprofit organization which offers classes in 3D animation, 3D printing, film editing, and beginning computer learning classes for senior citizens. Here's more with Jessica McKay. <music> Hi, I'm Jessica McKay and I'm standing here with Ted Vigvari at the PVNet Open House. You are the director of PVNet, is that right? And 
Can you tell us uh, what is PVNet for those of us not in the know? PVNet tries to serve as a technology center to provide uh, access for people to technology that otherwise they would not have access to. And it's a quite an impressive facility. You have lots and lots of computers and equipment and everything. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the facilities here? Certainly. Uh, we're, the, uh, we're a GIS center, which means we have geographic information systems. And it starts, uh, we actually start kids with at high school, middle, upper, uh, late, late middle school, all the way through grad student, uh, master's programs, uh, uh, teaching them uh, digital mapping systems. The uh, 3D printing and design is, is something that's uh, become very popular in the last two years. The, the advancement and the availability of systems for 3D <laughs> design printing uh, is going to. It's already spanned every field from uh, medical to pharmacology to engineering. Uh, it's just it's endless. Uh, so we one we have four of the uh, the large capacity 3D printers here. And that's this machine right here is the printer, right? Yes. In fact, it's uh, we just finished printing something uh, yesterday evening. But basically, the system uh, prints models that you design, or or we also have a scanner that takes 3D scans of objects and people. In the case of the one that's in here. That's a 3D scan of my mom. Angela, about how long have you been doing this? About two weeks. And what have you been learning so far? I've been learning to sculpt um, 3D in this program called Mudbox. Okay, and what, um, what type of things are you trying to teach her? I'm trying to teach her how to think in 3D, how to think of uh, just in general, how to look at real life uh, things. At, um, you can see right here that um, she's gotten really far in just a couple of of class times. Uh, we've only met a couple, like four times or so for, for actual classes and she's already really far and really excelling in the program. I'm using Autodesk Inventor, which is a program designed by Autodesk, which is also the program that is made by the company called AutoCAD. And what I'm doing is I'm making a phone case. So I have two different parts here and they're going to snap together. And on the bottom part of the phone case, I have my initials onto it, which are embossed and raised up, I guess. So when they print, it'll be there. And I'll be printing it in black and yellow. I'm learning um, this you know, program, Avid. And this is the industry standard Avid. The, this is the, the, ma the main program. What industry is that? In the, it, all over in the entertainment industry. Okay. I would say motion pictures, even in the animation industry, they use this too as well to edit their, um, edit the movies. Okay, so this is an editing program, and that's something that people can come in here and learn how to do? Yes, they can learn how to um, cut, cut film. They cut the, um, you, know, you, cut, you cut the film, and then you um, put it together. Well, I've had a really fun time here at PVNet learning about all the new and interesting technologies that are being learned and explored here. And I'm going to try one out. So I'm going to scan Aaron for his own 3D bust. Back to you, Maria. If you're interested in any of the classes or internships at PVNet, you can check out their next open house, which is April the 5th, or you can go to their website at pvnet.com. And finally, the community has lost a very special hero. 52-year-old Louise Brown passed away peacefully at her home with her parents, Pat and Frank, by her side. Louise, known as Lulu, touched many with her beautiful spirit and love of community. Louise and her parents were honored as Citizens of the Year by the PV Chamber of Commerce. Louise was the first student with Down syndrome to graduate from Rolling Hills High School. She was a passionate, talented actress who co-starred with George Clooney in an episode of ER. Louise was a guest right here on RPV TV, appearing in a cooking segment with her popular sister, Chef Christine Brown. She volunteered regularly at the Norris and worked at Goodwill Industries for nearly two decades. For the last 10 years, Louise attended Canyon Verde Adult Special Needs Activity Center in Redondo Beach. In lieu of a memorial, the family says donations can be made to Canyon Verde. The website is redondobeach.com slash cvc. Our sympathies go out to the entire Brown family. Louise will be missed and she will continue to inspire all of us. That will do it from us here at RPV TV. Make it a great day.